this, we are held in the hands of grace, in the arms of love, from our mother's love, from the love of the Alaska Center for Spiritual Living, the love of spirit that looks like this place, that looks like outside, that looks like this place that's inside of our heart. As we celebrate and honor all of us who have come here today, honoring all who join us via Facebook Live, YouTube later on, and all of the world, please join me in affirming in harmony. And so it is. We are an interfaith okay. gathering, a spiritual community that honors all teachings and all spiritual teachers. And now we begin the ceremony that celebrates this oneness of life, which acknowledges that all peoples and all faiths come for the one universal presence, which we call spirit. Our candle lighter this morning is none other than Linda Stein. Thank you for saying yes, Linda. And so let us begin. The Tao, honoring the universal path of harmony and equilibrium, the natural way. Shamanic traditions, honoring the beliefs and practices of all indigenous peoples, the way of pristine spirituality. Hinduism, honoring the path of knowledge, action, and devotion. Judaism, honoring the ethical path of living by sacred law. Buddhism, honoring the Four Noble Truths and the path of compassion. Christianity, honoring the Christ consciousness as the path of love. Islam, honoring the path of submission to the will of God as the highest calling. New Thought, Honoring the metaphysical path of mental healing through the practice of universal spiritual principles. The last candle is the healing candle of love and peace. We invite you in the stillness of your own mind to bring to awareness the names of anyone you wish to be included in this healing flame of love, of light, and of peace. Now that our flames of faith are fully lit and lighted, we move forward into our celebration, realizing and reaffirming that all paths lead to God. Our inspirational quote today comes from 365 Science of Mind, page 94, paragraph one. You and I could no more have an individual mind then we could have an individual ownership of the principle of mathematics or of harmony or of beauty. Each of us is creating in an individual way. We are individualizations in this one mind and no two of us are exactly alike. But we are all immersed in the collective thought of the whole human race. And so it is. So it is. More music.
Welcome. Good morning. My name is Karen Blair Sherman, and I am one of the licensed uh, practitioners here at the Alaska Center for Spiritual Living. And not only am I a practitioner in the building today, but we have Linda Steiner, and we have Bob and Judy and Robert in the back and Reverend Don. And I tell you all of these people's names because if you're here at the center, you can tap one of us and say, please pray with me. Please know the truth for me. Please celebrate with me. There's always lots to celebrate too. And we love to know the truth for you when you are in the depths of the effects of your life. And we also love to celebrate with you. And I say that and use myself as an example because I will always get on the phone. As soon as I recognize that I am in the effects and the world around me is crashing before me and I can see nothing but negativity and heartbreak or whatever it is that the effects that are uh, my current situation, I get on the phone <laughs> and I call somebody. And if one person doesn't answer, there's always someone else that'll answer. So there are many ways to receive prayer. Today, if you're here, you can tap one of us on the shoulder. If you're online or if you're here, you can, um, there's a way that you can write out a prayer request online. You also, if you're here, can write out a prayer request right here and leave it in the box as soon as you walk into the door. There's a brown box to your right. You can leave it there. I will send those prayers out and know the truth for you. We also are willing to do longer sessions than a one-minute miracle, what we call an OM. You can call one of us. I had someone do that recently with me in the past month, and we weren't able to get together, but the w some of the wonderful parts of the pandemic has reminded us that we do not always have to get together in person. There are many ways for us to connect our hearts, and that can be via Zoom, that can be through FaceTime, that can be even a call over the phone, or to merely, for me, to use my energy to collectively know the truth for you before we can even get together if I just know just a little bit. So there are many ways, and we love to pray. pray. We love to pray. Okay, so um, do we have some announcements? I'm not sure. Yes. Uh, one of the things that we've been talking about lately is that 5%. Where does that 5% of your offering go? Every year around January, February, the Gracious Giving Committee that I am on, Linda's on, um, and if Judy's on, um, and quite a few other people, Ann Lazenby, um, Cindy Hensley, Christina Young, Michelle Moore Jones, I think. We get together and we come up with all the places that we're going to give for 13 months because we always give to January um, too. And so I'm telling you those people because if you have something that's dear to your heart that you haven't felt like we have given to because now you're knowing all the places that we're giving to, please come and talk to one of us because we really try very hard to hit all places in our community, but it takes the collective group to know that maybe we're missing something. So um, please let us know. We try very hard to give to different places each time so that it's around every three or four years there's maybe something will cycle, cycle back. Anyway, this month we were giving to, sorry, can you go back to that other slide? We uh, were giving back to Facing Foster Care. Yes. Okay, and other announcements? Save the date, Sunday, August 28th. We will have Reverend Savannah Noel as our guest speaker. She also is gonna do a workshop right after there's a small intermission for people to use the restroom and collect themselves and whatever, and then we will go right on to the workshop. So um, please come and join us for that day. Are we gonna have a sign up anything, Rev Don, or people just show up? Just show up. Just show up, okay, perfect. So maybe if you're online and you're in the Alaska community, you'd like to join us on that day. Um, so I cannot think of any other announcements that we have other than to tell you that we are in for a doozer today. I am really excited to know what this one and only healing prayer is all about. And um, I will say the title also makes me think of Rev Don. He is the one and only. He likes to fish. 
he he has like really awesome things that he does if you guys don't know about it ask him he has some wonderful things that he does in his personal time that is just wonderful and when people like i know that savannah when she comes to join us there's some wonderful things that she will get to see in our anchorage community because he takes the time to bless those people with getting to know who we are and who we collectively are here at the alaska center for spiritual living and our uh, anchorage in alaska community so on to more music this is a beautiful song minister's moment oh minister's moment <coughs> not going to be one today okay savannah oh okay perfect <coughs> all right on to music <laughs> According to ancient uh, Hindu uh, legend, there was a time when all men were gods. But men abused this divinity. They, they began to fight with one another and argue and call each other names and put each other down. And they forgot how to see that divinity that was in each and every person. And so the head god, Brahma, decided he'd had it with these human beings, decided he was gonna take away their divinity. And so he did that. But then he had all this divinity and he didn't know exactly what to do with it. So he called a council of his head gods and said, what do I do with all this divinity that I just took away from the humans? And they thought for a while and they said, well, why don't you dig a big hole? You'll dig a big hole in the earth and put it in there and bury it. And Brahma thought about that for a bit. And then, nah, he says, those humans are pretty clever. They'll figure it out. They'll see there was a hole there and they'll dig it up. Oh, any more ideas? Well, why don't we find the deepest spot in the ocean the deepest trench in all of the oceans, and we'll take it there and sink it way down deep. 
And Brahma said, no, nah. he says, those humans will dive, they'll figure it out, and they'll, they'll dive and find it. Well, then how about if we put it at the top of the highest mountain? No, he says, they're climbers, they will get up and find it. Well, we're out of ideas, Brahma. We're, we're not sure what to do with all this divinity. So Brahma thought for a while and he said, I've got it. I will put this divinity in a place that mankind will never think of. I will bury it deep within each and every human. <laughs> and so today, we continue to walk this earth and we're searching high and low for spirituality, for connection, for all of these things when it's within us always, each and every one of us always. Well, good morning. Welcome ACSL to those of you who are here today, to those of you who are watching live on Facebook, those who are watching later, welcome and thank you for joining us. It is indeed an, an honor. The title of my talk today is The One and Only. And there's, our, our theme for this month has been relationships. So I want to talk a little bit more about relationships and there's four aspects of relationships that I want to cover today. First is our relationship with ourselves. Secondly is our relationship with our friends and family uh, and the community. Thirdly is our relationship with nature. And lastly is our relationship with God. So the relationship with ourselves. How we treat ourselves gives us an insight as to how we treat others and how we want others to treat us. And in this, there are three aspects. First is self-identification. And this refers to how we align, unify, and recognize the various aspects of our lives, even those that we do not like. We talk about the classes that we offer here and last week I went over all of the, the suite of classes that we are offering this fall. And in those classes we give an opportunity to have a structure to go within and look at those aspects of ourselves, some of which are the things of ourselves that we don't like, but it gives us a, a structure and ability to go in and do exactly that. We call that the inner work. The second uh, aspect is self-care, and that is recognizing our own value and worth. And it can take all kinds of different forms. It can be, you know, you can take time off work, uh, like a vacation, or uh, a number of different ways that we can practice self-care. But the heart of the idea, the concept of self-care, is that we love ourselves. Ernest Holmes wrote, Our greatest need is to feel that we are needed, wanted, and loved to feel that we belong to the universe in which we live. And when we can feel that we are needed and wanted and loved, we are loving ourselves. The third aspect is self-talk. And this is another thing that we get to practice in our classes. Uh, you get to carry around for a whole week a little journal and you watch all of your self-talk. And you get to record all the times you say things like, oh, I can't do that. I'm too clumsy. I don't have the right education. All of the negative self-talk. And it gives us an opportunity to take a good look at that. One of my favorite authors, uh, is speakers, God, I would love to get her up here someday. You know, if we set our intention, we could do it. We brought up Don Miguel Ruiz is Brene Brown. She wrote, I now see how owning our story and loving ourselves through that process is the bravest thing that we will ever do. Okay, my second point is relationship with our friends, our family, and community. 
our philosophy, this thing that we talk about every Sunday, the thing that we preach in the classes, the thing that we do, we practice all the time, can change this world. And it is changing this world. But sometimes we don't see it quite that way. A few weeks ago, Reverend Linda told a great story about a monk who, when he was young, made up his mind. He wanted to change the world. Well, after a few years, he matured a little bit and he realized he probably wasn't going to change the world. So he made up his mind, I'm going to change this nation. Well, a few more years went by and he could see that wasn't going to happen either. And so he made up his mind he was going to change the state that he lived in. A few more years and he changed his mind, decided he was going to change the community that he lived in, the small community that he lived in. And finally, when he was an older gentleman, he came to the awareness that the only thing that he could change was himself. And when we can begin to change ourselves, when we can find, look for that divinity that the Brahma hid within us, then we begin to make the changes not only in ourselves, but in our communities, in our states, our nations, and this is how we change the world. We are called and invited to serve and help others. And I pondered uh, a good way to demonstrate this, and I kept coming back to the story of the Good Samaritan. It's an interesting story, it really is. For one thing, it is, uh, it's in the Gospel of Luke, and it's the only place that it is. About 35% of Luke is unique to Luke. You know, so much of the uh, Gospels are all copied from one another, and primarily from the Q Gospel, which we haven't ever found, and the Gospel of Mark. But this is unique to Luke. And yet, when it was analyzed in the five Gospels, this is over 200 biblical scholars that have devoted their lives to studying the Christian Bible, have come to the conclusion that these are exactly or very, very close to the words of Jesus. There's very little in the Christian Gospels that these 200 scholars agreed on almost unanimously that, yep, that's exactly what Jesus said, but this is one of them. And, and I think you know the story of the Good Samaritan. Um, a man was on a trip from Jerusalem to Jericho. Um, that followed a, a road, I think they call it the road of blood because uh, so many times there were robberies and bandits and the, you know, a tough place and um, he was on this trip and sure enough he got held up by uh, robbers and he was beaten he was robbed of his clothes and all of his money and beaten badly and thrown to the side of the road to die and along came walking a priest and the priest looked down and looked over and said, whoa that dude's in bad shape Man, I don't want anything to do to that. And he walked over to the other side of the road and walked around him. Well, a little later, a uh, uh, Hittite, I think it was, came by, a Levite came by. And he did the same kind of thing. He looked down and said, whoa, this guy is in trouble. Um, I don't think he's going to make it. And I, I don't have time to mess with it. You know, I'll just let him go. He went over to the other side of the road and he went on around him. And then finally a guy from Samaria who was on a long trip came by and he looked down and he saw that there was still a flicker of life in this poor guy. And so he picked him up and he carried him to the next little hamlet where there was an inn and he turned him over to the innkeeper. He gave the innkeeper a little bit of money. He said, use this to take care of him while I am on my trip. And on the way back, I will settle up the deal with you pay for anything more that he needs, but please take care of him and nurse him back to health. And to this day, we know the story of the Good Samaritan. 
And it is that calling that we have within us to help those who are less fortunate, to help those who can use our help. When we have the ability and the capability within ourselves to help others, we are called to do that. You know, it's exactly what we do with our, our ties. The 10% that goes to home office certainly goes to help spread this philosophy on a much larger scale. And the 5% that we give helps nonprofits in all kinds of different things all over our community. We are not unlike the Good Samaritan. Third, everyone is an expression of God. I use that a lot. I talk about that. You know, we've had these horrific school shootings and grocery store shootings and our country, just the United States alone this year, we are averaging a mass shooting a day. And a mass shooting is defined as those with four or more casualties. But that's not new to our country. The first school shooting was in 1765. I mean, we're talking before the birth of our country. And we've been having them ever since. Now, the horror of them has increased with the the increased firepower we have. But this is not a new phenomenon. But what is new and what is unique is something that happened in 2006. And this was in Pennsylvania, in Amish country, in a little school, the Nickel Mine School, which was a small Amish school. And uh, a man, uh, bashed his truck into the school, got out, uh, held the, um, the students all uh, captive, um, the teacher and uh, her mother who happened to be there that day actually escaped and were able to get to the next farm that actually had a phone and were able to call 911, which it, things would have been much better. But he proceeded to let the boys go, and then he began killing all the girls. And um, he killed five. Five more survived. But the thing that's so remarkable about this event isn't the horror that we talk about and see all the time. It is the reaction of the Amish people. I think our Amish brothers and sisters have really pointed a way. Later that day, one of the Amish elders was heard saying to the group, do not hate this man that did this. For he has a wife, he has a daughter, and he has a mother as well. He has hurt us, but he has hurt himself. Let us not hate him. And I think that's a, a powerful, powerful message. The Nickel Mines School. Uh, the third area is our relationships with nature. Uh, that's one I could go on all month. In fact, I'm going to. Uh, the month of August is going to be nature. We're going to be talking about nature. But today I'll use one tiny, tiny slice of that as sort of an example. And I want to talk about symbiotic relationships. And there are essentially, and I'm oversimplifying, but that's okay, three types of symbiotic relationships. The first is parasitism, and that is where one party is helped, but the other one is harmed. And an example of that uh, are the leeches that attack um, 
salmon and trout in the Great Lakes and on the East Coast. And these lamprey eels, these leeches, go up and attach themselves to the trout and the salmon and suck out all of the nutrients. They suck out all of the blood and, really, and they grow themselves, but they kill their host in the process. The second type is called commensalism. And this is where one party helps and the other uh, party has no effect, it, neither good nor bad effect on the other party. And an example of that is what's known as the remora fish. They uh, attach themselves to fins of sharks and they use the shark as transportation to get vast distances throughout the ocean. The shark never even knows they're there, but the remora fish has a, a free ride. And um, in addition, they help the, uh, themselves. Oftentimes the shark will make a kill and eat it and then leave some leftovers and the remora fish will clean it up, if you will, and then jump back on for another ride. A third type of a symbiotic relationship is mutualism. And this is the one that we're most familiar with. And we have a picture today of the ox peckers. Uh, they uh, often accompany large mammals. Here we see some, uh, they have both yellow bill and uh, red billed uh, ox peckers on a zebra. Um, and this is the relationship where both parties benefit. The zebra is often attacked by another uh, parasite uh, type of a relationship of a particular type of a uh, bug that burrows into these large mammals. It lays its eggs in there. It, de it destroys the muscle fiber and, and is damaging to the large mammal, that in this case, the zebra. And so the um, ox pecker travels with the large mammal and it eats these uh, bugs that are boring themselves into the larger mammal. So in this relationship, the um, ox pecker gets food, free meal, plus a ride, and the zebra is able to shed itself of this debilitating creature. So, and the reason that I bring these things up is we live in a world. We live in nature. No matter how cityfied we think we are, no matter how much we think we have defeated nature, all we have to do is look at the floods, the things that are going on today, and we realize that Mother Nature is way stronger than we are. And we have to live in harmony with this world in which we live. And it benefits us if we as a species can develop mutualistic relationships rather than parasite relationships. The final point that I want to talk about is our relationship with God. And this gets back to this idea, how do we see the divine in one another? It is only until we can see the divine within ourselves when we can find that which Brahma hid, that we can then see that divine in others. And what a gift that is to be able to do that. Ernest Holmes wrote, all things, ourselves included, are some manifestation of it. And by that he's referring to God. Hence, all things have a direct relationship to it. And since it is all things, this relationship is direct and immediate. It is within us. And when we can focus not on what other people may do or think or what we judge them as, but when we can see past that and see the divinity that is within all of us, then we can move to a place of peace and joy and harmony as opposed to conflict. When we can get to that place, then Brahma no longer has to take our divinity away. We once again become 
more godlike. The conclusion. I had a really good thing all written and then I came across this quote, and I don't know if it even fits right or not, but it, I liked it so much that I'm going to do it. Fred Rogers. If you could only sense how important you are to the lives of those you meet, there is something of yourself that you leave at every meeting with another person. For you see, you are the one and only. You are that expression of the divine. And so it is with that awareness of our own inherent divinity that I invite the practitioners to join me. I invite the congregation to join me in knowing that there is indeed a power in the universe, a magnificent, infinite power in the universe that is continually and forever expressing itself through and as each and every one of us. And so as we go through this thing called life and we experience all of the things that happen to us from disease, from lack and limitation, from conflict, we can recognize that that infinite power is indeed working with us and through us at every turn, at every moment. And that when we can get our bloated nothingness out of the way, we can release our judgments, we can release our opinions and only see God, then we can move through anything. And so, as I speak my word now for those people who are experiencing those things in life, they are real. It is absolutely a real thing that sometimes there's more month than there is paycheck. We know that there are diseases. We know that there are things that can take our lives. COVID is real. We don't deny the reality, but what we do know is there is a greater power. There is something that's greater than that, that allows us to do that, that allows us to see the divine in all. And it is that which we do in this day, this moment. We see beyond the effect and know the capital T truth for the presence of the capital I, it, that is within us. And so we just give thanks and now we let this go, we let it be, and so it is.
<laughs> ah. <laughs> Thank you. Ah. I think they gave up on trying to make the font big enough so I can read the names of people online. Now, now hand it to me. That one seems to work a little better. Uh, do want to recognize some of the people watching today. Michelle Kuntz, Janet Hanston, Luann Pogue, Claire Koppel, uh, Lynn and Marion are watching today. So, just a few. And the YouTube, maybe I'll go over those next week. We've had some just amazing things on YouTube. I mean... Remarkable. So, um, this is a time in our service where we afforded the opportunity to participate in the law of circulation. So, if you'll join me in our affirmation, divine love through me blesses and multiplies all that I have, all that I give, and all that I receive. Thank you, God, and so it is. As we draw to a close this day, knowing that this one and only carries through with us throughout the week, because it's been embedded in us now, right? And so it's not only that it's carrying, we are carrying it out this week, we are carrying it out and it resonates through us forever and ever and ever and ever, because my soul sings out for that. And so when we find the divine in ourselves, we find the divine in others. Finding the divine in all allows us to find our peace, our love, our oneness, our wholeness. Find the word that resonates with you. Ready? One, two, three. It helps us find our joy. joy. And so much more. And so it is. And so it is. Sing.
Shouts! Shouts. 